Bank International, now open at 208 South LaSalle Street in Chicago, the English bank with the American accent, now presents on WFMT The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Tonight we begin broadcasting the last of our special three-part Sherlock Holmes stories, and here's the beginning of The Hound of the Baskervilles. <laughs> within the hour. I checked all the facts that were mentioned at the inquest, the footprints, the absence of physical injury, the facial contortion. He said there were no traces on the ground round the body. He didn't see any. I did. Footprints? A man's or a woman's? Mr. Holmes. They were the footprints of a gigantic hound. <laughs> And so began perhaps the most terrifying of all the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. My name is Watson, Dr. Watson, and it was my privilege to share them. But if ever I felt it a doubtful privilege, it was in this our encounter with the Hound of the Baskervilles. I will tell you what happened. In the fog last week, I caught this dreadful cold. Please excuse me. You've traveled enough in your time to know that most traveler's checks are better than money because if they're lost or stolen, you can easily get them replaced. But you should also know that there's one traveler's check that's better than all the others, Barclays traveler's checks. Better because there's usually a fee or service charge which must be paid when you purchase traveler's checks, but Barclays traveler's checks cost you nothing extra. No fee, no service charge, no commission. And to a traveler like you, that could come to quite a savings. And you get Barclays Traveler's Checks, of course, at the English bank with an American accent, Barclays Bank International. Like Barclays Traveler's Checks, Barclays Bank is known and respected the world over. Barclays' new full-service Chicago bank is only one of more than 5,000 Barclays offices around the world dedicated to the financial freedom of people like you. So if you're planning a trip this summer... Stop first at Barclays for your free of commission Barclays Traveler's Checks. Barclays is located at 208 South LaSalle Street. Barclays Bank, Chicago and the world. My friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, was usually very late in the mornings save on those not too infrequent occasions when he stayed up all night. One morning, it was in the autumn of 1889, he was seated at the breakfast table in his dressing gown. I was standing on the hearth rug, looking at a stick which a visitor had left at our Baker Street rooms the night before. It was a fine, thick piece of wood, bulbous headed, of the sort that used to be known as a Penang lawyer. What do you make of that stick? We missed its owner yesterday and have no idea of his errand, so this accidental souvenir assumes some importance. Let me hear you reconstruct the man by an examination of it. Just follow my method. Um, well, I... I think he's an elderly medical man. Why? Because the inscription on the silver band to James Mortimer, MRCS, from his friends of the CCH... 1884. Excellent. What else? I say he's a country practitioner who does a great deal of his visiting on foot. Oh, why then? Well, because the thick iron ferrule has been worn down and the whole stick has been terribly knocked about. <laughs> I can't see a town doctor carrying it. Perfectly sound. And what about the friends of the CCH? Well, I think that's the, um, something Hunt, uh, whatever the local Hunt's called. He's probably helped them professionally, and they gave him this stick in return. Really, Watson, you excel yourself. Most stimulating. Oh, Holmes. And now that I've finished breakfast, I'd like to have a look at that stick myself. Just hand me over my convex lens, will you? Co yes. Thank you. <coughs> now, let me see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid, my dear Watson, that most of your conclusions are erroneous. What? 
Not that you're entirely wrong. The man is certainly a country practitioner. Ah, then I was right. To that extent. Where did I go wrong, then? Well, for one thing, I would suggest that a presentation to a doctor is more likely to come from a hospital than from a hunt. And when the initial CC are placed before that hospital, the words Charing Cross naturally suggest themselves. <laughs> you may be right. The probability lies in that direction. And since the presentation was made but five years ago, there emerges a young fellow under 30, amiable, absent-minded, and with a favorite dog, something between a terrier and a mastiff. Now, now, just a minute, Holmes. How do you know he's amiable, absent-minded, and has a dog? Well, it's my experience that only amiable men receive testimonials. And he was absent-minded enough to leave his stick here yesterday. Oh, true. Well, what about the dog? Well, look at the teeth marks on the stick. See? I, I, As I say, they're too broad for a terrier, not broad enough for a mastiff. Uh, let me take it over to the light. Yes. Oh, yes, by Jove, it's a, a curly-haired spaniel. My dear fellow, how can you possibly be sure of that? Simply by looking out of the window. Oh. Dog <laughs> and owner are on our very doorstep. <laughs> uh, he's a tall, thin man, a bit bent at the shoulders. Oh, yes, and his frock coat's a bit worn. Come in. Ah, you have my stick. <laughs> I'm so very glad. I wasn't sure whether I'd left it here or in the shipping office. I wouldn't use that stick for the world. A presentation, I see. Uh, yes, sir. From Charing Cross Hospital? Uh, yes. Ah, oh, then we're not so far wrong, Dr... Uh, Mortimer. James Mortimer. Yes, sir. I'm now in practice in Devon at Grimpen on Dartmoor. I came to you because I am confronted with a most serious and extraordinary problem. I have in my pocket an old manuscript. I observed it as you entered the room. It's a, a family document. It was committed to my care by Sir Charles Baskerville, who died some three months ago in Devon. Oh, yes, I remember reading about that. Mr. Holmes, until his sudden and tragic death, Sir Charles was a patient and also my personal friend. He was strong-minded, shrewd, practical, and as unimaginative as I am. Oh, God. But he took this document very seriously and was prepared for just such an end as eventually did overtake him. What's it. in the document? A certain legend that runs in the Baskerville family. <clears throat> it tells the story of the death of Hugo Baskerville, who held the manor at the time of the Great Rebellion. Hugo, Mr. Holmes, was a wild, profane, and godless man. His name was a byword in the West. It happened that he fell in love with the daughter of a yeoman who held land near the Baskerville estate. This girl avoided him, and one Michaelmas he stole down upon the farm with five or six wicked companions and carried her off to the hall. They put her in an upper room and sat down to a long carousal. The girl, in the stress of her fear, climbed down the ivy that still covers the south wall and set off homeward across the moor. Go on. Some time later, Hugo went upstairs to see his captive and found her gone. And here I think I must quote the manuscript itself. <sighs> <clears throat> then it would seem he became as one that hath a devil, for rushing downstairs into the dining hall, he sprang upon the table, flagons and trenchers flying before him, and he cried aloud before all the company that he would that very night render his body and soul to the powers of evil if he might but overtake the wench. <clears throat> and at that, Mr. Holmes, this wicked man ran from the house and had his groom saddle his horse and unkennel the pack. You mean he put the hounds on her? He did. He gave them the girl's handkerchief and set off full cry in the moonlight over the moor. But good heavens, didn't the others try and stop him? Well, they just seemed to have stood there, stupefied. But then some sense came back into their minds and they rode off after him. They found Hugo Baskerville's black mare dabbled with froth and riderless. Sure. They found the hounds whimpering in a cluster at the head of a dip. Three of the boldest riders, or maybe the most drunken, rode down into the dip. And there they found the unhappy girl lying dead with fear and fatigue. Poor girl. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't that that raised the hair on their heads. Let me quote the actual words again. <clears throat> it was that standing over Hugo and plucking at his throat, there stood a great foul thing, a black beast, shaped like a hound, 
yet larger than any hound that mortal eye had rested upon. And even as they looked, the thing tore out the throat of Hugo Baskerville. Mm. Then, as it turned its blazing eyes and dripping jaws upon them, the three shrieked with fear and rode for dear life, still screaming across the moor. One, it is said, died that very night of what he had seen, and the other twain were but broken men for the rest of their days. <clears throat> the writer ends by counselling his descendants never to cross the moor in those dark hours, as he puts it, when the powers of evil are exalted. Great heaven. <laughs> now we come to something a little more recent. The death of Sir Charles Baskerville in June of this year. Let me say at once that Sir Charles was a man of very different mould from his infamous ancestor. Many people had good reason to bewail his untimely end. It was sudden, you say? Indeed, yes. Not that his health had been good for some time. There was an affection of the heart showing itself in breathlessness and nervous depression. Was he a married man, Dr. Mortimer? He was a widower and childless. Mm -hmm. He lived very simply. His indoor servants at Baskerville Hall consisted of a couple named Barrymore, who acted as butler and housekeeper. They corroborated my own evidence at the inquest about his health. What happened? Well, the facts are quite simple. Every night before he went to bed, Sir Charles used to walk down the famous Yew Alley of Baskerville Hall. On the 4th of June, he declared his intention of starting for London the next day and told Barrymore to pack for him. That night... He went for his walk, as usual, and never returned. Who raised the alarm? The Barrymore, the butler. He found the hall door open, became alarmed, and went out with a lantern. Halfway down you alley, there's a gate that leads out onto the moor. Sir Charles's footprints led there, and there was evidence that he had stood there for a while. Then the footprints continued, but appeared to be those of a man... Running for his life? Where did they lead? To the far end of the alley. And there the body was found. Any signs of violence? No, but the face was incredibly distorted. At first, I couldn't believe that it really was Sir Charles. How do you account for the distortion? Well, if it's a symptom that is not unusual in cases of death from cardiac exhaustion. Yes, that's true enough. Mm. The post-mortem showed a long-standing organic disease and the coroner returned a verdict in accordance. Those are the public facts. I see. Then can we now have the private one? He would never go out on the moor at night. One evening, about three weeks before he died, I drove up to his house. He was standing at his hall door. Uh, just as I was getting out of my gig, I noticed his eyes fix themselves on something over my shoulder and stare with an expression of horror. He was so excited and alarmed that I had to go down to the spot and look round. But there was nothing. I had to stay with him all the evening. That's when I suggested he should go to London. Uh, Mr. Stapleton, a mutual friend, was also very worried about him, and he agreed with me. And then, at the last instant, came this terrible catastrophe. How soon did you see the body? Well, they had to send the message over. I was there within the hour. I checked all the facts that were mentioned at the inquest, the footprints, the absence of physical injury, the facial contortion... But Barrymore made one false statement in his evidence. Oh? What was that? He said there were no traces on the ground round the body. He didn't see any. I did. Footprints? A man's or a woman's? Mr. Holmes. They were the footprints of a gigantic hound. Great heavens! There are sheepdogs on the moor. No doubt. But this was no sheepdog. What is this alley like? Well, there are two lines of old yew hedge. Impenetrable, 12 feet high. Penetrated at one point by a wicked gate, you say? Yes, which leads on to the moor. Is there any other opening? None. Was this gate closed? Closed and padlocked. How high is it? About four feet. So anyone could have got over it? Yes. Dr. Mortimer, what made you say that Sir Charles had waited by the gate? His cigar ash. He dropped it there twice. Excellent. Watson, this is a colleague after my own heart. Mr. Holmes, several people have seen a creature on the moor. Something that couldn't be any animal known to science. A huge creature, luminous, spectral. And you, a trained man of science, believe it to be supernatural? I don't know what to believe. 
Surely the footprints were material. The original hound was material enough to tear out a man's throat. But it was diabolical as well. Dr. Mortimer, if you hold these views, why have you come to consult me? You tell me in the same breath that it's useless to investigate Sir Charles's death and that you desire me to do it. I did not say I desired you to do it. Oh? Then how can I assist you? By telling me what to do about Sir Henry Baskerville. Sir Henry? Is this the heir? Yes. He's Sir Charles's nephew, the son of his younger brother. He's been traced in Canada. He's been farming there. He arrives at Waterloo in, uh, oh, let me see, um, just under an hour and a quarter. Are there any other claimants? No. The only other kinsman we have been able to trace was Roger Baskerville, the youngest of the three brothers of whom poor Sir Charles was the eldest. He was the black sheep of the family. The very image, so they say, of old Hugo. England became too hot for him and he died of yellow fever in Central America. Henry's own father, the middle brother, died young, so he is the last of the Baskervilles. I had a wire to say that he arrived at Southampton this morning and I'm on my way to meet him. Mr. Holmes, what am I to do? I suggest you call here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning and bring Sir Henry with you. <laughs> I'll do that, Mr. Holmes. Uh, just one more question. You say that before Sir Charles Baskerville's death, several people saw this apparition on the moor. Yes. Did anyone see it afterwards? Not that I've heard. Thank you, Dr. Mortimer. Good day, Mr. Holmes. Good, Good day, day, Dr. Sir. Watson. Good day, Doctor. I'm very much obliged to you. Listening to The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, being brought to you from the BBC over WFMT in Chicago and presented by Barclays Bank International. Now offering Barclays Travelers checks free of commission, offering no charge checking with a $300 minimum balance, offering you always a friendly cup of tea, and if you like, for your personal checks, a cameo of Sherlock Holmes imprinted in the top left corner. Barclays Bank International at 208 South LaSalle. The next morning, our clients were punctual. As the clock struck 10, Dr. Mortimer was shown up, followed by the young baronet, a man of about 30, sturdily built, with the weather-beaten appearance of one who spent most of his time in the open air. This is Sir Henry Baskerville. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Uh, Holmes? Sir Henry. Dr. Uh, Watson. Do, sir. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the strange thing is, if my friend here hadn't proposed coming round to you this morning, I'd have come on my own. Or it was this letter. If you can call it a letter. It reached me by the first post. Sir Henry Baskerville, Northumberland Hotel, Charing Cross. Who knew you were going to stay there? Well, no one. We only decided after I met Dr. Mortimer. But presumably he was already staying there. No, sir, no. I've been staying with a friend. There was no possible indication that we intended to stay at that hotel. I see. Well, somebody seems to be deeply interested in your movements. Um, may I read the letter? Oh, please do. As you'll see, it's only a single sentence. I notice it's made up of printed words pasted onto a sheet of foolscap. Hmm. As you value your life, or your reason, keep away from the moor. The word moor is written in ink. It's the only one. Now, perhaps you'll tell me what in thunder's the meaning of that. Any watermark? I wonder. No, no, I, I don't see any. Now, tell me, Sir Henry, has anything else of interest happened to you since you've been in London? Oh, no, I... I don't think so. You've not observed anyone following you or watching you? <laughs> they seem to have walked right into the thick of a dime novel. Now, why in thunder should anyone follow me or watch me? We're coming to that. You've nothing else to report to us. Well, no. Um, well, unless you think it's worth reporting that I've lost one of my boots. Have you indeed? Yes, I, I put them both outside my door last night, and there was only one there this morning. I... I couldn't get any sense out of the fellow who cleans them. It seems a singularly useless thing to steal. Oh, I told him it's bound to turn up again. Uh, now, look, gentlemen, 
it seems to me that I've spoken quite enough of the little I know. It's time you kept your promise and told me what we're all driving at. I quite agree. Dr. Mortimer, will you be good enough to tell Sir Henry your story as you told it to us? By all means. It begins, Sir Henry, with this manuscript, uh -huh. which has been in the possession of your family for generations. Well, I seem to have come into an inheritance with a vengeance. Of course, I've heard of the hound since I was in the nursery, but I never thought of taking it seriously. But as to my uncle's death, I, I, can't, I can't get it clear yet. You don't seem to have made up your minds whether it's a case for a policeman or a clergyman. Precisely. The point we have to decide now, though, Sir Henry, is whether or not it's advisable for you to go to Baskerville Hall. Why shouldn't I? There seems to be danger. You mean danger from the family fiend or danger from human beings? That's what we have to find out. Hmm. Well, whichever it is, my answer's fixed. There is no devil in hell, Mr. Holmes, and there is no man on earth who can stop me going to the home of my own people, and you can take that as my final answer. Bravo! <laughs> now, uh, now look, Mr. Holmes, I, I'd rather like a quiet hour to myself to think about all this. Of course. I'll, uh, I'll go back to my hotel. Uh, look, why don't you and Dr. Watson come and lunch with us there at uh, 2 o'clock? Oh, thank you. Is that convenient to you, Watson? Perfectly. Yeah. Then you may expect us. Uh, shall I have a cab? Call no, no, no. I prefer to walk. If you'll join me, Dr. Mortimer. With pleasure. Well, then we'll meet again at two. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Bye. gentlemen. Good morning. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, he seems a good enough chap. Quick, Watson, while I get my frock coat. Watch at the window and see which way they go. What do you mean? A... Of course. Isn't it clear there are people up their tails? We must shatter them and see what happens. Look in the shop window. We'd better do the same. No, wait. Look at that handsome cab. It has stopped as well. It's following them. That's our man. In the cab? Yes. Let's get a look at him. Oh, curse it. He's seen us. He's shouting to his cabby. Let's run off. Oh, useless. They've got too good a start. Oh, Watson. If you're an honest man, you can record this and set it against my successes. Who was the man? I've no idea. Did you see his face? Oh, I saw the big black beard. Quite so. Probably a false one to conceal his true features. He is at a disadvantage, sir. You mean he's put himself in the power of the cabin? Exactly. What a pity we didn't get the number. My dear Watson, clumsy as I have been, you surely don't imagine that I neglected to get that. Uh, 2704 is our man. We must find out by wire the identity of the cabman and arrange to question. Well, what about Sir Henry and Dr. Mortimer? Oh, there's no point in following them now. Yeah. Come, Watson, the nearest telegraph office, and then we can drop into one of the Bond Street picture galleries and do that. Ah, Mr. Holmes. Sir Henry, did you know you were followed from my rooms this morning? Followed? By whom? Well, whoever he was, he informed the cabman that his name was Sherlock Holmes. Good <laughs> Holmes. Uh, Dr. Mortimer, have you among your acquaintances on Dartmoor any man with a black full beard? Um, well, let me see. Ah, yes. Barrymore, Sir Charles's butler. He has just such a beard. Who is this Barrymore? Oh, his family have looked after the hall for four generations now. Did Barrymore profit at all by Sir Charles's will, Sir Henry? Yes, he and his wife had, uh, what, 500 pounds each. Ah. Did they know it was coming to them? Oh, yes. Sir Charles was fond of talking about his will. Ah, that's very interesting. I hope you don't suspect everyone who received a legacy from Sir Charles. I myself was left a thousand pounds. Indeed. And anyone else? There were a number of small bequests to individuals and charities. The residue all went to Sir Henry here. Sir Henry, hmm? how much was the residue? 740,000 pounds. Really? I had no idea that so gigantic a sum was involved. It's a stake for which a man might well play a desperate game. One more question, Dr. Mortimer. If anything happened to our young friend here, you'll forgive the unpleasant hypothesis, who would inherit the estate? Some distant cousins named the Desmonds. James Desmond is an elderly clergyman in Westmoreland. 
I see. Tell me, Sir Henry, hmm? have the mysterious events of the last few hours caused you to change your mind about Baskerville Hall? Mr. Holmes, they have just made me all the more determined to go down there the very first moment I can. Then I only make one provision. You certainly must not go alone. Dr. Mortimer's going with me. But Dr. Mortimer has his practice to attend to, and his house is miles away from yours. With all the goodwill in the world, he may not be able to help you. No, Sir Henry, you must take somebody with you. A trusty man who will be always by your side. Well, could you possibly come yourself, Mr. Holmes? If matters come to a crisis, I should endeavor to be present in person. But my extensive practice and the constant appeals that reach me make it impossible for me to be away from London indefinitely. Uh, no. Well, uh, whom would you recommend, then? If my friend Dr. Watson would take it, there is no man better worth having at your side when you're in a tight place. No man can say so more confidently than I. Oh, well, well, well now, that's, that's real kind of you, Dr. Watson. Look, if you'll come down to Baskerville Hall and see me through... I'll never forget it. I'll come with pleasure. I, I don't know how I can employ my time better. Excellent. Now, Watson, mm -hmm. you will report very carefully to me. When a crisis comes, as it will do, I will direct you how to act. Yes, yes. Could you start by Saturday? Does that suit, Dr. Watson? Oh, perfectly. Then on Saturday, unless you hear to the contrary, we shall meet at the 10.30 train from Paris. As the train sped out of Paddington, I looked back at the tall, austere figure of Holmes gazing after us. A pleasant journey it was. And in a very few hours, the brown earth had become ruddy, the brick changed to granite. And then, over the green squares of the fields and the low curve of a wood, there rose in the distance a grey, melancholy hill with a strange, jagged summit. There you are, Sir Henry. There's your first view of the moor. Dartmoor. <laughs> you know, I've been over a good part of the world, but I've never had a moment to compare with this. This is your homecoming? Yes. Yes, but it's more than that. This is where the men of my blood have lived for centuries. Up on those moors. And up there, too, there's something that has haunted them and driven them to their death. I know one thing, gentlemen. Whatever it is that lurks up there, whether it's man or fiend, it's not driving me away. I'm going to face it and beat it. Martinique, Tanzania, Dubrovnik. Wherever your vacation plans take you this summer, Barclays Bank International has a special going-away present to make your travels completely free of money worries. Barclays Traveler's Checks. Barclays Traveler's Checks are the closest thing yet to an international common currency. They're accepted at face value throughout the world. And with over 5,000 Barclays offices around the world, all strategically located to serve you, they can easily be replaced at no cost to you should they be misplaced or stolen. Best of all, they're free at Barclays. As part of Barclays' good neighbor policy, you can get Barclays traveler's checks without paying a penny extra for commission. When you think of all the places you plan to stay, the things you plan to do, and the things you plan to buy, that could come to quite a saving. So before you leave the country, come to Barclays for your free of commission traveler's checks. Your longest journey can begin with one short step to Barclays Bank, 208 South LaSalle Street. Chicago, and the world.